on time, we start with the next talk. Um, I welcome Richard Hartman. He is involved in Debian since many years and he became recently a Debian developer. And he will talk about Gitify your life. Web, blog, configs, data, and backups. Gitify everything. <laughs> Richard Hartman. Thank you. Thank you for coming, especially those who already attended all of those buffs. Um, yeah, short thing about myself. As Gordon said, I'm Rich, uh, Richard Hartman. In my day job, I'm a backbone manager at Globalways. I'm f involved with Freenode and OFTC and, oh, should I speak louder? I, I'm not sure. Test, test. Good back there. Uh, can you turn up the volume a little bit? Test, test? Okay, perfect. Okay, um, since about a week, I've been a Debian developer, yay. And I'm the author of VCC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so raise of hands, who of you knows what Git is? Perfect. That's just in as a backup plan, but perfect, we can skip it. Let's move to the first tool, ETC Keeper. Some or maybe even most of this audience will have heard of it. It's a tool to basically uh, store your slash ETC in pretty much every single um, version control system you can think of. It's implemented in POSIX shell. It auto commits everything in ETC uh, basically at every opportunity. You may need to write excludes, for example, for your network config when you have DHCP, but else, um, yeah, that's really cool, the auto commit. It hooks into most of the important, or maybe even all of the important um, package management systems. So um, when you install new packages, even on, on SUSE or whatever, you can just have it commit automatically, which is very nice. Uh, you can obviously commit manually if you, for example, change your X config. Um, it supports, as I said, various backends, and yeah, it's it's quite nice to recover from failures. For example, Axel used it to recover from Saturday's power outage because some servers lost stuff, and with ETC Keeper, he could just replay all the data, which was rather nice. Then there's Bob. Bob is a backup tool based on the Git pack file format. It's written in Python. It's, it's very, very fast, and it's very space efficient. The author of Bob managed to reduce his own personal backup size from 120 gigabytes to 45 gigabytes just by migrating f away from our snapshot over to Bob, which is quite good. I mean, that's almost or a little bit more than a third, so very good. Um, this happens because it has built-in deed application, because obviously uh, Git pack files also have deed application. You can restore every single mount point or every single uh, point in time. Every single backup point can be mounted as fuse file system or by means of fuse file system independently on, on the, of each other, so you can even compare different versions of what you have in your backups which again is very nice. The one thing which is a real downside for most serious deployments, um, there is no way to get data out of, your, out, of your, um, out of your archive or out of your backups, which again is a direct consequence of using Git pack files. Um, there is a branch which supports deleting old data, but this is not in mainline and it hasn't been in mainline for I think one or two years, so I'm not sure if if it will ever happen, but yeah, at least in theory it would exist. Then for your, for your websites, for your wikis, for your whatever, there is IkiWiki. IkiWiki is a wiki compiler, as the name implies, and it converts various different files into HTML files. It's written in Perl, it supports various backends, again, most of the ones you can possibly think of, Oh, and I can even slow down, great. <laughs> um, it, it's able to parse various markup languages, more on that on the next slide. Uh, there are several different ways to actually edit any kind of content within uh, IkiWiki. It has templating support, it has CSS support. These are quite extensive, but they may be improved, but that's for another time. It acts as a wiki, as a CMS, as a blog, as a lot of different things. 
It automatically generates RSS and Atom feeds for every single page, for every single subdirectory. So you can easily subscribe to topical content if you're, for example, only interested in one part of, of a particular page. Just subscribe to this part by RSS and you don't have to check if there is any updates or anything, which is very convenient to, to keep track of, of comments somewhere or something. And it supports OpenID, which means that you don't have to go through all the trouble of having a user database or doing very or doing a lot of anti-spam measures because it turns out OpenID is relatively well suited for just uh, stopping spam bots for some reason. Maybe they just didn't pick it up yet. I don't know, but it's it's quite nice because you don't have to do any actual work and people can still edit your, your content and you can still track back changes at least to some extent. It supports various markdown languages. The best one, well, debatable, but uh, in my opinion, it's Markdown. It supports wiki text, restructured text, text style, plain HTML, and there are specific, wiki specific um, extensions. For example, normal wiki links, which are a lot more powerful than the normal linking style in Markdown, which kind of sucks, but whatever. Um, it also supports uh, directives, which basically tell IkiWiki to do special things with a page. For example, you can tag your blog pages, or you can uh, so make, uh, generate pages which automatically, automatically pull in content from different other pages and stuff like this. That's all done by directives. How does it work? You can um, edit the web page directly if you want to on the web. Then you will um, have a, a rebuild of the content, but only the, the, the part which changes. So if you, hello, okay. If you change only one single file, it'll only rebuild one single file. If you change, for example, the navigation, it will rebuild everything because obviously um, it needs to rebuild everything. Hello, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, if it has to generate pages automatically, for example, new index pages or something, if you just create a new subdirectory or if you have if you have comments which start to appear on your site, it will automatically generate those markdown files and commit them or you put them in your in your source directory and you can just commit them and and have them be part of a, of your site or you can auto commit them if you want. That's possible as well. And you can obviously change, uh, pull in all changes in your local repository if you wanted to, to look at them. Common uses would be public wiki, uh, private notes for just note keeping of your personal to-do list or whatever, um, having an actual blog, which a lot of people in this room probably do. That's, yeah, I mean, a lot of people on Planet Debian have their blogs in IkiWiki for, for good reason. And an actual CMS for, for company websites or stuff which also tends to work quite well. Um, the three main ways to interact with IkiWiki are web-based text editing, which is quite useful for new users, but it's quite boring, in my opinion. Um, there is also what you see is what you get editor, which is even more fancy for, for non-technical users. Uh, there's just plain old CLI-based editing where you just edit files and commit them back into your repository, push this up, and everything gets rebuilt automatically, which is in my opinion, the best way to interact with IkiWiki because you're able to stay on the command line and simply push out your, your stuff onto, onto the web, but uh, you don't actually have to leave your command line, which, yeah, is pretty convenient. There are also some more advanced use cases. Um, as I said, you can interface with the source files directly. You can maintain, um, something is wrong. For example, you can maintain your wiki and your docs and your source code in one single directory, and it will simply um, and simply have part of your subdirectory structure rendered. For example, git annex does this. There is a doc directory which gets rendered to the website, but it's also part of the normal source directory, which means that everybody who checks out a copy of, of the repository will have the complete form, bug reports, to-do lists, user comments, everything on their local file system without having to leave, again, their command line, which doesn't break media, and so it's just very convenient to have one single resource for everything regarding one single program. 
And another nice thing is if you create different branches for preview uh, or staging areas, you can even have workflows where some people are just allowed to, to create pages. Other people then look over those pages and merge them back into master and then push them to the actual website, which basically allows you to, um, to have content control or, or real publishing workflows if you, if you have a need to do this. Yeah, next up, Git Annex. The beef. <laughs> um, it's basically a tool to manage files with Git without checking those files into Git. That might sound counterintuitive. Um, yeah, what is Git Annex? It's based on Git. It maintains the, the metadata about files, as in location and file names and everything, within your Git repository, but it doesn't actually maintain the file content within the Git repository. More on that later. This saves you a lot of time, uh, time and space. Um, you're still able to use any Git Annex repository as a normal Git repository, which in turn means you're even able to have a mix of, for example, saying all your readme files should be uh, maintained by normal Git, and then you have all the, um, the merging uh, which Git does for you and everything. And then you have, for example, your photographs or your video for web publishing, which are maintained in the annex, which means you don't have to have a copy of those files in each and every single location. Um, a very nice thing about Git Annex is that it's written with very low bandwidth and flaky connections in mind. If, mm, Quite a lot of you will know that Joey lives basically in the middle of nowhere, which is a great thing to, uh, to be forced to write really efficient code, <laughs> which doesn't use a lot of data, and this shows it's really quick, and even if you had a really, really bad connection in backwater or whatever during holidays or during normal living, um, it's still able to transfer the data which you need to transfer. This is very, very nice. And there are various workflows. We'll see four of them in a few minutes. So, it's written in Haskell, so it's probably strongly typed and nobody can write patches for it. <laughs> it uses rsync to actually transfer data, which means it doesn't try to reinvent any wheels. It's really uh, just basing on top of, of established and well-known and well-debugged programs. In indirect mode, which in my personal opinion is the better mode, um, what it does is it moves the actual file into a different location, namely .git slash annex slash objects. It then makes those files read-only, so you can, cannot even accidentally delete those files. Even if you RMF them, it will still tell you, no, I can't delete them, which is very secure. Might be inconvenient, but um, you can work on this. It replaces those files with symlinks of the same name, and those just point at the object. And if there is an object behind this symlink or not, that basically determines if you are able to access the data on this particular machine or in this particular repository. But you will definitely have the information about the name of the file, the theoretical uh, location of the file, um, the hash of the file will be in every single repository. There is also a direct mode. Um, initially mainly written for Windows and Mac OS X because Windows just doesn't support symlinks properly and OS X, while supporting symlinks, apparently has a lot of developers which think it's a great idea to follow symlinks and display the actual target of the symlink instead of the symlink. So you have cryptic file names which are really hard to deal with and obviously people who are used to GUI tools which then only display really, really cryptic names, so that's no good. So there's direct mode, which doesn't do the symlink stuff. It basically um, rewrites the files on the fly. It, it, Git still thinks it would, is, it would be managing symlinks, but Git Annex just pulls them from under Git and pushes in the actual content. You keep on nodding, so I'm probably doing good. <laughs> um, and if you want, you can always delete old data, or you can keep it. Or you can just, uh, for example, what I'm doing, you can have one or two machines which slurp up all your data and have an everlasting archive of everything which you ever put into your annexes. And then other machines, for example, laptops with smaller SSDs, those just have the data which you're actually interested in at the moment. How does this work in the background? Um, each repository has a UUID, 
it also has a name, which makes it easier for you to, to actually interact with the, with the repository, but in the back end, it's just a UUID for obvious reasons, because it just makes uh, distributed generation and synchronization yeah, easy, period. It stores all tracking information in a special branch called Gedanix. This branch means that all... Should I? <laughs> this branch... Um, ensures that every single repository has full and complete information about all files, about the location of all files, about the last status of those files, if those files have been added to some repository and then deleted, or if they have been over there forever. So in every single, in every single repository, you can just look up the status of this file or of all files in all other of your uh, repositories, which is yeah, convenient. The tracking information is very simple, and it's designed to be merged. There's, it's a little bit com more complicated than a plain union merge, but basically what it does is it just has a timestamp and tells you if the file has been there or not, and it has the UUID of the repository. And from this information, along with the timestamps, you can simply reproduce the whole life cycle of your files through your whole cloud of, um, of Git Annex repositories in this one particular Annex. One really nice thing which you can do is, um, if you're on the command line, which again, in my opinion, is the better mode, um, you can simply run git annex sync, which basically does a commit. Oh, it does a git annex add, then it does a commit, then it merges um, from the other repositories into your own master and into your own um, git annex branch. Then it merges the log files, that's where the git annex branch comes in, and then it pushes to all other known repositories which is basically a one-shot command to synchronize all the metadata about all the files with all the other repositories. And it takes no time at all, given network connection. Data integrity is something which is very important for, may, yeah, for all of the tools, but uh, Git Annex is really designed with data integrity in mind. Uh, by default, it uses SHA-2-256 SHA uh, with file extension to, uh, to store the object, so it renames the file to its own SHA sum, which allows you to always verify the data even without Gedanix. You're able to say, uh, by, by means of globbing, which files or which directories or which types of files should have how many copies in different repositories. So for example, what I do, all my raw files, all the raw photographs are in at least three different locations. All the JPEGs are only in two because JPEGs can be regenerated, raws cannot. All remotes and all special remotes can always be verified with special remotes. This may take quite some bandwidth with actual normal Git Annex remotes you run the verification locally and just report back the, um, the result, which obviously saves a lot of bandwidth and, and transfer time. Verification obviously takes the amount of required copies into, into account, so if you would have to have three different copies and in your whole repository cloud you only have two, it'll complain. It will tell you, yes, the checksum is correct, but you don't have enough copies, please do something about it. And even if you were to shoot Joey right now uh, and delete all copies of Git Annex, you would still be able to get um, all your data out of Git Annex because what it boils down to in indirect mode, it's just symlinks to other objects. These objects have their own checksum as the actual file name. So you'll even be able to verify without Git Annex just by means of a little bit of shell scripting that all your files are correct, that you don't have any bit flips or anything on your local disk. Direct mode doesn't really need a recovery scheme because the actual file is just in place of the, of the symlink. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, you won't be, you still need to look at the git annex branch to, to determine the actual checksums, which you wouldn't have to do with the indirect mode. There are a lot of special remotes, and what are special remotes? They are able to store data in non-Git Annex remotes. Because let's face it, on most servers where, or on most services where you could store data, you aren't ab actually able to get a shell and execute commands. You can just push data to it and you can receive data, but you cannot actually execute anything on this computer. <coughs> That's what special remotes are for. Um, all special remotes support encrypted data storage, so you uh, just GPG encrypt your data and then send it off, which means that the remote services 
can only see the file name, but they can't, cannot see anything else about, your, about the content of the files, which uh, is, yeah, obviously you don't want to trust Amazon or anyone to store your plain text data. That would just be stupid. And there's a hook system which allows you to write a lot of um, new special remotes, and you'll see a list of, a quite extensive list um, of, of stuff in a, in a second. Normal built in special remotes, which are supported by Haskell out of the box, or by Git Annex out of the box, and implemented, actually implemented in Haskell, are Amazon Glacier, Amazon S3, BUP directory, a normal directory on your, on your system, RSync, WebDev, HTTP or FTP, and the hook system. There's a guy who wrote most of those. Um, where you can support archive.org, IMAP, box.com, Google Drive. Yeah, you can read yourself. I mean, but those are uh, quite a lot of different uh, special modes. So if you already have storage with any of those services, just start pushing encrypted data to it if you want to, and you're basically done. There is an ongoing project called the Git Annex Assistant last year, and I think this year just ended, didn't it? Um, so, pretty much exactly one year ago, Joey has started to, um, to raise funds by means of Kickstarter to just focus on writing um, Git Annex Assistant for a few months. He got so much funding that he could do it for a whole year, uh, and he just re restarted the whole thing with his own fundraising campaign without the overhead of Kickstarter, and he got another full year. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you still accepting funds? Okay. <laughs> so if you use it, at least consider donating. Because, <laughs> because you, honestly, you can't write patches for it anyway, because it's in Haskell, so that's the other means of, of actually contributing. Um, Git Annex boils down to being an assistant, uh, a daemon which runs in the background. And keeps track of all, your, of all your files, of newly added files. It keeps, uh, then, it, it then starts transferring those files. If configured to do so, it starts transferring files to, to other people or to other repositories. Um, this is all managed by means of a web GUI, which in turn means that it's really, well, not easy, but easier to port to, for example, Windows or Android, which both work to some extent. Uh, not fully, but they're useful or usable, more or less. Uh, yeah, at least on Android, it's really quite well. I, I, I couldn't test it on Windows because... <laughs> yeah. um, and it also makes it accessible for, for, uh, for non-technical users. So, for example, if you want to share your or some of your photographs with your, with your parents or with friends, or if you want to share, I don't know, videos with other people, uh, you just put it into one of those repositories, and even those non-technical people just magically see uh, stuff appear in their, in their own repository and ju can just pull the data if they want to. Or if you configure it to do so, it will even transfer all the data automatically, which is, yeah, it, it, it's mom compatible. That's the short version. It uh, supports content notification, but not content transfer by means of XMPP or Jabber, which used to work quite well with Google Talk. I think it's not... Oh, it still works, okay. At least at the moment. We'll, we'll see when they just cut the cord and replace it with Google Plus, but um, yeah. At least at the moment it still works by... Uh, if, you, if you have a Google account, you can simply transfer all your data. Or you can transfer the metadata about your data. You cannot actually transfer the files through Jabber, but that's probably something which will um, happen within the next year. There are quite advanced rule sets for content distribution. So, for example, it can show you. Um, how am I doing? Okay, it can show you. Um, you can say put all raw files into this archive and all JPEGs onto my laptop or whatever. Or if I still have more than 500 gigabyte free on this disk, please pull data in. And as soon as I only have. 20 left, uh, stop pulling data into this one repository, which obviously is quite convenient. Um, as I said, there's an Android and Windows port, and now on to use cases. First use case, the archivist. What the archivist does is basically he just collects data, either to ever look at or just to, to collect. 
And if you, if you have this use case, what you probably want to do, you want to have offline disks to store at your mom's or to, uh, to put into your drawer, or just you don't, ha you don't have enough SATA ports in your, in your computer because you just have so much data. So what you can do is you can just push this data to either connected machines or to disconnected drives or to some web service and just store data. But normally you would have the problem of keeping track of where your data lives, if it's still okay, if it's still there, everything. With Git Annex you can automate all this administrative side of, of archiving your stuff. And even if you have only one of those disks, if there are proper uh, remotes, uh, you will have full information about all the data in your Annex cloud up to this point. So even if you only pull out one random disk, you'll still have information about all the other disks on this one disk, which obviously is, is a nice thing. Media consumption. Um, let's say you pull a video for, of this talk, or you uh, get some slides, maybe also from this talk, you may get some podcasts, and Git Annex has become a native podcatcher quite recently, I think two or three weeks ago, which means you don't even have to have a separate podcatcher. You just tell Git Annex, this is the URL of my RSS feed, and it'll just pull in all the content. Then you can synchronize all this data, for example, to your cell phone or to your tablet or whatever. Consume the data on any of your devices, even if you, ten, even if you have ton, 10 copies of a particular podcast, because you didn't get around to listen to it on your computer, you didn't get around to listen to it on your, on your uh, cell phone, but then on your tablet you did listen to it. And you have three copies of this file which you don't need anymore because you listened to the content and don't care about the content anymore. What you do is you drop this content on one random um, repository. And this information that you have dropped the actual content, not the metadata about the content, but the actual content, and don't need the content anymore, will slowly propagate to all other annexes, and they, if they have the data, they will simply also drop the data. So you don't, have to, um, you don't have to really care about keeping track of those things. You can simply have this message propagate. Do you want to comment? Can someone give Joey a microphone? Just as a minor correction, um, it doesn't propagate that you've dropped the content, but you can move it around in ways that have exactly the effect that you described. I just didn't want people to get the wrong idea that if you accidentally removed it from one thing, it would vanish from everything with us. That's no, not no, what no. happens. Yeah. But if you deliberately drop the content and tell the annex, I don't. No, no. That's not how it works. We'll have to talk about it later. But it's. Um, you looked at the slides, but. Well, I'm sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> he watched for everything which is by him. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Next thing, if you're uh, on the road, and one use case which is probably quite common, taking pictures while on the road while during holidays. You take your pictures, you save them to your annex, you are able to store them back to your to your server or wherever if you want to, and even if. For example, one disk get, uh, disk gets stolen, and you lose a part of your content. Uh, you will still at least be able to have an overview of what content used to be in your annex. And if you then pull out your old SD cards and see, oh, that photo is still there, you can simply re-import, and it'll just magically appear. What it also does is, if you have a very tiny computer with you, you can, as soon as you're at an internet cafe, just sync up with your server or your storage or whatever, and push out the data to your um, to to your remotes which then means you will have two or three or five copies of the data, and Git Annex keeps track of what is where for you, so you don't have to worry about copying stuff around. Yeah. And then there is one personal use case for photographs. Um, I have a very specific way of organizing my photographs. My wife disagrees violently, and... <laughs> She likes to do uh, her photo storage in a completely different way, and she doesn't care about raw files, and she doesn't care about all the documentation pictures of signposts or whatever, which I took to just remember which city we went through. Uh, so what she can do is she can simply delete the actual file, or more to the point, the symlink of this file, and it will disappear from her own annex. She can then commit all this. Normally, if she would sync back the data, I would also uh, have the same layout, which I don't want especially since she tends to rename everything a lot. 
Uh, but what I did, I set up a, re a rebasing branch on top of my normal Git Annex repository. So what she gets is she has her own view of the whole data, or the part she cares about, and when I add new content, she'll see the new content, she will rearrange the content however she pleases, but as it's a rebasing branch, all her changes will always be replayed on top of master. So um, she has her own view, and I don't even notice her own view. But even if, he, if she uses one of the other computers, she will have the same view which she, she herself has. So basically, she has her own view of all of the data. This is very convenient to keep the piece at home. Next topic, VCSH. Most of you will probably have some sort of system where they have one subversion or CVS or whatever repository and they have it somewhere in your home directory. You symlink into various places in your home directory and it kind of keeps working so you don't really throw it away, but to be honest, it sucks. Here's why. Um, or here's why in a second. <laughs> uh, VCSH is implemented in POSIX shell, so it's very, very portable. It's based on Git, but it's um, not directly Git. The one thing which Git is not able to do is maintain several different working copies within one directory, which is a safety feature, more on that later. But this really sucks if you want to maintain your M player, your set shell, your whatever configuration in your home directory, which is the obvious and only real place where it makes sense to put your configuration. You don't want to put it into dot dot files and then symlink back. You want to have it in your home directory as actual files. So VCSH uses fake bare good repositories. Again, more of that on the next slide. And it's basically a wrapper around Git, which makes Git stuff do, uh, with, which makes Git do stuff which it normally wouldn't do. And it has a quite extensible and usable hook system, which Gordons will care about. Um, with a normal Git repository, you have two really defining variables within Git. You have the work tree, which is where your actual files live, and you have the Git there where the actual Git data lives. Normally, in a normal checkout, you just have your, you have your directory and .git under this. Yeah. If you have a bare repository, you obviously don't have an actual checkout of your data. You have um, just all the objects and the configuration stuff. So that's what a, ba a bare repository boils down to being. A fake bare Git repository, on the other hand, it has both. It has a Git work tree and it has a Git there, but those are detached from each other. They don't have to be closely tied together. And it also sets core bare false to actually tell Git that, yes, this is a weird setup, but yes, you still have a work tree. Even, of, even though you don't really expect to have one, you still have a work tree. By default, WCSH puts your work tree into home and you get there into, yeah, it's boils down to dot .config, uh, vcsh repo d, and then the name of the repository, which just puts it away and out of, out of the way of you actually seeing stuff. But it follows the cross desktop specifications, so if you move stuff around, it'll also follow. Fake bear repositories are really, thank you, are messy to set up, and it's very easy to get them wrong. Um, this is also the, the, uh, the reason why Git normally disallows doing this kind of stuff because all of a sudden you have a lot of, of context dependency on when you do what. Just imagine you set git work there, uh, git work tree, sorry, and run random commands like git add, that's kind of okay. If you git reset hard hat, yeah, you will probably not be too happy. If you, if you check out the current version, that's also quite bad, and if you clean F, yeah, you just killed your home directory. Congratulations. So um, it's really risky to run with, uh, with these variables set, which is why I wrote v uh, VCSH to just wrap around Git to hide all this complexity and do quite some sanity checks to make sure everything's set up correctly. Um, again, it allows you to have several repositories and it also manages really the complete lifecycle of all your repository. It's very easy to just create a new repository, you just in it, just with Git, you add stuff, you commit it, and you define a remote, and then just start pushing to this remote. Simple. This looks like Git because it's very closely tied to Git, and it uses a lot of the power or of the, of the syntax of Git for obvious reasons, because it's closely tied to Git. You can simply clone as you would with Git, 
you can simply show your files that you would with Git. You can rename the repository, which Git can't do, for, but you don't have to. You can show the status of all your files, or just of one repositories, or of all repositories. You can pull in all your repositories at once. You can push to all your repositories at once with one single command. Um, so if you're on the road, or if you just want to sync up a new machine, it's really quick, it's really easy. There are three modes of dealing with your, uh, with your repositories. The default mode is the quickest to type. It, you says, just say vcsh, zsh, commit, whatever, or just any random git command. But you cannot really run git k. You can do this by using the run mode, which is the second mode, where you simply interject. You see here, run is missing, and here, the git is missing. So you say simply vcsh, run, zsh, git, commit, whatever. And this and this is exactly the same command. It's literally the same command once it arrives at, at the shell level, so to speak. Here you can also run git k, because with this, you set up the whole environment to, for one single command to run with this context of the changed um, environment variables. Or you could even enter the repository, then you set all the variables, and then you can just use normal git commands as you would normally. This is the most powerful mode, but it's most also the most likely to, to hurt you if you don't know what you're doing. So I recommend working your way down this way. You should have uh, your shell display prompt information about being in a VCSH repository or not, uh, simply because else you may forget that you entered something. And then if you run those commands, there will be pain. Um, an advanced use case, which will be possible quite soon, uh, where you can just combine VCSH and Git Annex to manage everything which is not a conf configuration file in your own home directory. So you have basically two programs to sync everything about all of your home directory without having to do any extra work. You can also use it to do really weird stuff. For example, you can back up a .git of a different repository with the help of VCSH. So you can just go in, change objects or anything, break stuff, and just replay whatever you're doing, just to try and see how it breaks in various interesting ways. You can just back up a working copy, which is maintained by a different uh, repository or a different system. You can even put a whole repository, including the .git, into a different git file, or you can even put other VCSs like this version or something into git if you want to. Then there's MR. MR ties all those, hopefully, by now you have about 20 new, 20 new repositories because you have your configuration, you have your ikiwiki, you have everything. So now you need something to synchronize all those repositories because doing it by hand, uh, just a lot of work. MR supports push-pull commit operations for all the major known uh, version control systems, allowing you to have one single interface to operate on all your systems. It's quite terrible to write uh, support for new systems. I think it took me about two hours to support VCSH natively, so that's really quick. If you want to try the stuff which I told you about, in the links later there'll be uh, the possibility to, to just clone a sample repository for for uh, VCSH, which will then um, put up a suggested MR directory layout, and we can just work from there. This is the, or at least my suggested layout, which basically you just include everything in config.d, you maintain your available.d by means of VCSH, so you just simply sync around all your content between all the different um, computers, and then you simply soft link from available to the co actual config, which is basically what Apache does with, uh, with sites enabled and sites available, or modules available and modules uh, enabled, which is really, really powerful. Last thing, it's not Git-based, but set shell. It's a really powerful shell. You should consider using it. It has very good tab completion for all the tools which are listed here, more than bash. It has a write prompt, which will automatically disappear if it needs to, which is very convenient to display not important but still useful information. And it will automatically, if you tell it to, tell you about you being in a Git repository or a subversion repository or whatever by means of VCS info, info, which also means you'll be told that at the moment you are within a VCSH repository and you may kill your stuff if you do things wrong. 
It can mimic all the major shells, and there's just too many other reasons to live. So, final pitch. This is true. I tried it early. I can demo it. I still have five minutes left. Um, it takes me less than five minutes to synchronize my complete whole digital life while on the road. So if I'm, if I'm at the airport and just want to update all my stuff and push out all my stuff, it'll take me a few minutes that I can hop onto the airplane and I know everything's fine, everything's up to date on my local machines. I have on my local machines. I can continue working, and I have a backup on my on my remote systems. These are the websites. The, uh, the slides will be linked from from uh, from Penta, so you are more, more than welcome to look at these links later. There are previous talks which you can also look at if you want to. Um, that's pretty much it. And if you have any more questions afterwards, either catch me or uh, there's an IRC channel, and there is a mailing list. Okay, we can take a few questions. We have still a few minutes, but if there are more questions, ask Richie. Afterwards. And while we're doing this, just look here because that's a complete sync of everything I have. Okay. So just to make sure that I understand correctly, with Git NX, the point is that the data is stored, dispersed over different local destinations, so to speak, but the metadata, which versions exist, is complete, uh, complete Git history. So Git is able to tell me, well, this version at that uh, destination was changed at that time, and so on, and so on, and so on. Did I get, get this right? Or is it, uh, Git, Git will be able to tell you about changes. Okay, I don't have internet. Sorry. Uh, Git will be able to tell you about changes in the file name or the directory structure. Git Annex will be able to tell you about changes in the actual file content or okay. in moving around the files. But as it's one single unit, more or less, uh, yes. The answer is yes, but not quite, but yes. Um, yes, but it is all, it, all the things you asked about are in Git. The, um, yeah you know, the previous location and all that stuff. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but in a separate branch, which you should use Git Annex to access, but you can do it by hand if you want to. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm not familiar with tracking branches uh, yet. Um, you mentioned a workflow where your wife has a different view on the data than you. Uh, with this workflow, is it possible for your wife to upload photos that you will have in your view or, as well, or is it a one-way street? Um, minor correction, it's not. Tracking branches track a different repository. What I meant were rebasing branches, which rebase on top of a different branch, which basically just keeps the patch set always on top of the branch, no matter where her head moves to. Um, yes, she would be able to, but uh, if she wanted to do that, she would need to uh, simply git check out master, do whatever she wants to do, then git check out her own uh, branch, and then she's, yeah. But she's able to, but she would need to check, uh, to change into the master branch and then back. But yeah, that's, okay. Microphone. She never pushes her private branch, it only lives on her a machine. No, she does push it, um, but I don't display this view of the data. Because else she wouldn't be able to synchronize this view between different computers. I seem to have internet now, so I'll just let this run in the background. Any more questions? No more questions? Then we are we done have one more minute for questions. Okay. Okay. So thanks, Richard Hartman. We will continue.